Hey guys, Phil from One Wall Studio here again, and this time I'm here to discuss a very interesting topic for a lot of you. It's going to be called editing in Reaper. Now, I'm mostly just going to be showing the ways that I do it because I only really know my way best. So, I'm actually going to start with guitar and then work my way back to drums. Now, usually if I was recording, I would be recording the drums and editing them as I went along so that the band could use those to play off of. So, one thing that I want to keep in mind here, you'll notice that there are times when the guitars are slightly off time or only one is off time and the other is not. One good thing that I do, one technique that I typically use is, I look for the first place that the guitar is on time, and I find a place in between that and the place where it starts to deviate from that timing a little bit. So let's say it goes off, goes from being a little bit ahead of the beat over here to being a little bit behind the beat over here. And the best way I can deal with that might be to look at my snap to grid settings, changing the line spacing until I have a, a much better idea of where these eighth notes would fall. Once I've done that, I want to get rid of snap. So one way you can do this on a typical Reaper macro is Alt-S, which will disable that, or you can click on the magnet button up in the top left corner on your toolbar. However you want to do it, as long as you disable snap, you can now be in slip edit mode, as the Pro Tools users are familiar with. So check this out. For or so measures that I want to work on, I've decided to cut it so that I can't affect the ones before or after. Now that does change if you have ripple editing enabled. I have it disabled right now, but if you were to enable ripple editing, then you could do this, and it would move every track in front of your track, or you could have it enabled on all tracks, so when you do ripple edit, you're moving everything. Now that might be good for a podcast or something where there has to be a consistent spacing between all of the tracks, but for the time being, I'm going to defeat that so that it doesn't move my tracks when I'm trying to edit. All right, so first things first, I don't always have to be this tight, but I'm going to move this over to the beat where it's supposed to be, and then I'm going to extend this a little bit. Now you'll notice, Having that crossfade that automatically comes up helps it to sound a little bit more natural so that it doesn't sound like I just, you know, tore it apart and am dragging it through the timeline like I, I actually physically am. A lot of the times for long legato sections, this kind of thing does work, especially if you've got a long chord held out or something like that. The average person probably won't notice it. One thing to be mindful of is where you want to begin and where you want to end. Now, generally, you can jump around a lot in between and try to work your way from the outside in, so to speak. So, for example, I'm going to move this one here because that's where it's supposed to be. I'm also going to move this one here. Now, a lot of this video, I'll be speeding through edits because once you know the general concept, you'll understand a lot more easily what I'm going for. All right, so I see this one, I started to chug a little bit before the beat, and this one, I started to chug a little bit after the beat, and so on and so forth. Keep in mind, it's totally acceptable to do as much or as little editing as you feel is necessary because at the end of the day, it's your work, it's your song, and however you feel it will work best is how it will work best. If you want to, you can hold shift and press up on your keyboard to increase the size of the waveforms. Now, you'll notice that as I do so, all of the waveforms in the track increase in size, which just helps a little bit to see the quieter details. But also, you'll notice that the bus that it has them sending to, the parent track, also has a summation of the waveforms of both sides right there. So if I wanted to expand this, you'd see that if I were to reduce the size of this, it would go away. If I were to increase the size of this one, it would come up in there. So this parent track is actually a summation of all the waveforms, and that is very helpful Later on, as you decide to do more editing, you'll find that that might be really useful, but it might also be a hindrance depending on what you're trying to edit and how you have things sent to Paratrax. Now immediately you hear that because the right side is more on time now, the left side sounds less on time, in spite of the fact that previously it was more on time. So here we're going to do something a little bit more interesting. I'm going to do the regular click and drag and hope this sounds natural. All right, so that did work. 
Uh, the one thing that I will say is sometimes it doesn't quite work out that way. A good example being this section over here. In Reaper, if you expand a waveform, it'll send it out to the, the length that it was before. So this is the length of that note, and this is how it sounded. But I don't want that. I want this to line up with the beat over here. But then if I extend it outwards, it cuts into that measure. See, it just does that note again. So what you can do here is use Shift-W to create a marker point for stretching, a stretch marker, or you could right click on the item, you could click stretch markers, and then you could hit add stretch marker at cursor. From now on, I'm probably just gonna be doing it with the key command because it's a lot faster. I'm going to extend this to the length that it should be to reach up to the next bar, and then extend so until it's a little bit more even. And there, you don't even notice that anything changed. So, you can do a little bit more comprehensive guitar editing that way with stretch editing if you didn't play a note long enough and you don't have enough to go off of to make it more natural sounding, you can do it that way. However, sometimes it's just as easy as taking the next note and extending it backwards so that it fills out the area that was removed. Now there's a lot of stuff going on here, but because the waveform's already so big, I'm gonna shrink it down, and I'll do some editing here. Here's a very clear example. With quarter notes, it's really easy to see where things deviate on and off time. And one thing you can do, say I wanna edit this whole section, and I know I wanna edit this whole section, since this is already sliced over here, I can just work my way from the back forward. Bring that closer to the line. Make that a little bit easier, a little farther from the line, a little closer to the line, so on and so forth. The bigger it is and the fewer notes there are, the easier it is to manipulate without any undue effects, which is what makes uh, chugs like this so easy with the long sustains to edit. Now in general it does help to have at least one very well recorded track just in case somebody got sloppy the second time around, but that's not always possible. Which is why it's important to get really used to these kinds of tools and functions and to use your judgment where it's applicable. Here, editing this actually made it more difficult for me and I made a little bit more work for myself because they were aligned more tightly with these chugs in the beginning and now the well-recorded track, I have to do a little bit more editing as well to keep up with the level of uh, perfection that is now expected, judging by the rest of the song. However, I do like to leave a little bit of a human element, and sometimes there are places for things like a little bit more width from a slightly off-time guitar part. So, all in all, use your judgment and do what you need, but... You saw it only took about 10 minutes to edit this guitar line, but that's also because for the most part, it was pretty decently played, if I do say so myself. The fun part is when you get into something like drums. Now, my favorite method of messing with drums is I select every single track in the drums, make sure I don't have anything else selected in the song, and then I either press G on my keyboard, or I go into the menu and I hit group items, which as you see right there has the little indicator that G is the hotkey. So now I'm working on every single one of the drums. Now, just like the other tracks, I also want to do this in slip edit mode because otherwise, if you were to try to do this in grid snapped mode, you would only be able to go to specific notes. And sometimes if you wanted to just move this, which is in between these two, you would then have to go here and slice that and then slice that and then slice that and then pull that with holding shift to slip edit and then move this and then move that. And it's a very long process. However, if I'm in slip edit mode, which as most industry professionals know is very helpful, I just have to do this. Boom. So that's what I mean when I say slip edit. Because it doesn't snap to the grid automatically, I can just click anywhere I want, slice it, and drag it. Very helpful for anybody who's doing a lot of extended editing in Reaper, especially on drums. All right, so one thing I want to do usually is I'd like to separate the different sections of the song based on what kind of editing they'll need. So I'm going to make some cuts here. Make some cuts here. 
and all these cuts are going to help me lay the groundwork for the different sections that I'm working within. That way, if I were to forget something or make a mistake and accidentally move like all of this, I've only moved about 20 seconds worth of audio. I'm not moving the entire track and then realizing, oh no, I absolutely have to edit the whole thing now because I made everything off time. Uh, one of my favorite parts about drums is that you can, for the most part, focus entirely on this. And you can see a lot of the waveforms very, very easily. This way, as I click and I drag and I edit, I can pretty much just align things mostly to the grid. Now there will be places where there's a little bit of human variation and that's not really a bad thing if things are slightly off. You notice how because everything is grouped together, when I move one it moves them all, when I slice one it slices them all. I'm using the S key of course to slice, which you could also do every single individual time by going into the right click menu, split items at cursor option, but I find that to be a lot more clicking than is necessary because I'm already doing a lot of clicking. Sometimes, especially with a good drummer, the groove tends to be maintained, so you only have to move, say, a measure or half a measure at a time. You don't really have to do any extreme editing. In this case, this was me, so it's not I'm not I'm not that great a drummer. Don't forget to do those crossfades because those crossfades are very, very helpful at maintaining a natural sound. And don't forget, you can right-click on either the snap grid settings or the snap grid settings by right-clicking on the grid lines enabled or the snap disabled function. And then you can change the spacing or the size or the... You can change a lot of things about the grid. Because if you're going to be looking at this grid for a decent amount of time, it might help to make sure it looks the way you like. Sometimes looking ahead a little bit can help you figure out where you need to go and how far behind you are or how the sway of the track is going so far. And as a result, you can usually pretty closely intuit where they were out of pocket and when they come back on. Especially with tom rolls and such. Tom rolls tend to be very easy to keep in the pocket. Now you'll notice here that the kick and the snare are out of time. Now if you wanted to do something about that without affecting the rest of the tracks, you could go to group and you could remove those items from the group. And since this is synced up with the snare and the hats, you can manually drag the kick a little bit so that it lines up more with the, with the snare or the toms or whatever you need. And it may leave some artifacting in the rooms, but for the most part, it's not extremely noticeable. I know people like Billy Decker and a lot of other producers tend to hate it when there's a flam sound in the kick and tom or the kick and the snare or they sound ever so slightly off time. It doesn't really bother me so much because to me it just sounds very human. You can tell that there's a little bit of speeding up here as the intensity of the song increases. That's very common to see as our bodies naturally want to move faster when we play an instrument like the drums where the aggression comes from hitting things. Now that I'm in the next section of the song, you gotta keep in mind that was just 20 seconds of song. I'm going to zoom through this and I'm only gonna stop if anything interesting comes up because for the most part, editing is a tedious, time-consuming process. So the better the original take, the better off you are and the more time you've saved. The fact that I tried to make something for the purpose of editing just means I was making more work for myself than I needed to. Now, sometimes you'll come to an impasse like this, and you'll probably realize, huh, that's, uh, that's a little weird. I'm not sure how this is supposed to line up, because it's just ever so slightly off time. Truth is, you could probably fudge it sometimes. Uh, the kick here, for example, you can definitely tell that the kick is supposed to be closer to this, so you could probably, using context clues, determine that the kick is the only thing that's really off time here. Pressing U to ungroup. All right, and then same here. It's just a little trick for saving some time for yourself. Oh my goodness, that is... <laughs> Hardcore Tom's being off time. Oh 
Oh my goodness, this is really off time. What have I done? Worst comes to worst, and you want to maintain the way something was played without destroying the feel and the groove of it, but you still want something to be on time. One trick that you can use is to just have one element be perfectly on the click, or two elements be perfectly on the click, because then you don't kill the sway, you don't destroy the performance, you don't mess with it in any way except for to bring one part of it a little bit closer just to give you that pulse of the metronome. But otherwise, a lot of older musicians know the feel of a track isn't necessarily a bad thing. Things that run a little bit behind or ahead of a click, even in heavier genres, can still be a positive thing. You just have to understand why and where it's appropriate. So I'm focusing on making the kick the driving force of this particular section. And the toms, they're rolling, they're doing their thing, they're having a gay old time. Everything's cool there, but then this kick is going to be the thing. So let's hear how it goes. Honestly, there's very few parts of that that I even really want to tighten up, mostly just because I feel like it's a groove thing, right? And I was a client of mine saying, well, that could be tightened up. I'd agree. I'd be willing to go a little bit more in depth with it and say, yeah, okay, we can do that. I don't have a problem with it. It's your track. But in this case, as the artist and the producer, I think it's a judgment call. Now, one way that I know that I should be pulling things back instead of pushing things forward is the hit here that's supposed to align with the 29th measure is actually a little bit forward. So I can generally work from that direction. Again, it's a context thing. And of course, there's no real right or wrong way to choose when to use certain tools and when not to, up to the discretion of the person doing the mixing. All right, so now we've come to a whole new section we're close to the end here. Going to make sure that all of our stuff is lined up pretty neatly. Now here I'm going to be focusing a lot on the overheads because this is a very ride driven section. All right, so now that you've seen me go through this whole entire thing and measure out painstakingly every individual place where I wanted to do an edit, it's time that you learned an interesting fact. One thing I like to do once I've finished an edit is I like to preserve that edit in a new version of the project. Very easy to do in Reaper. Control-Alt-Shift-S or go to File and Save New Version. It'll just append the title with a little underscore and then whatever number you're on. So now the original version has all the edits made to it. I could open that up anytime if I decide to. I also like to consolidate all of my tracks or glue them, glue these items so that, boom, very easy to look at, very easy to manipulate again if I need to. I can go through and adjust things again because they're still accessible to me, but now they're glued. So if I wanted to do something, I would just have to group them again and commit a new edit. However, it's a lot easier to look at now without all those lines. You can generally see that everything lines up a lot smoother. And if you hear something that you need to change, you're not married to it, but you can easily get to it and you can see where that new edit has been. Typically, by copy number three of a project, I'm already at that point where it looks like this and I only have maybe one or two places with edits on them. Because it's just easier to look at that way. Once you've listened to it, of course, it helps to glue it or consolidate it. But I wouldn't recommend doing that before you listen through it again, just to make sure that you didn't miss any spots, didn't cause any damage to it, because otherwise you'll have to load up the last version of the project and go through it again. And that's how you edit tracks without losing the human feel of them. You can adjust them to be a little bit tighter, a little bit closer to the click. Tracks that are still performed the way the person performed them, but just a little bit closer to the click. I wouldn't recommend a lot of automatic solutions because in the end, you'll probably cause more harm than good with an automatic solution. So an example of that being, I'm going to press D, which is the dynamic split option, which splits to transients. Okay, split there. And now I'm going to quantize. 
So if I press Q, that's my default quantize button for a quarter note. Clearly that's a thing that would work better for drums, but even if you did it for drums, it would still potentially cause issues if it wasn't close enough to the note. A couple of those were actually closer to the next 16th note or the closer to the next 8th note than they were to the note it was supposed to be on. So definitely tread with caution when doing something automatic. Thank you for joining me, and if you have any other suggestions or products you want me to review, any questions that I can answer, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below, and I will do my best to teach all of you everything you've ever wanted to know about audio. So thank you very much for watching. I'm Phil from Almost Studio and good night.